Well, hello, everybody. Who's happy to be in the house today? Anyone, huh? It's great to see all of you. You know, I just feel God's presence in the room today. I haven't done this at any of the services, but I feel like God's healing some people right now in their physical body. And specifically, someone that's been involved in a car accident, there's some injuries of some kind that haven't healed. And I want to think a sense that the that the injuries happen recently. But if you're here and you need healing in your body or maybe you're that individual, I just want you to just lift a hand to the Lord. We don't have to make it some big dramatic moment because Jesus just walked by people and they're healed. But Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would heal every person whose body is sick, they've received a diagnosis, they've suffered an injury. Lord, I pray that by your grace and your love and your power that you would pass by them today And God, that you would heal them supernaturally. We thank you for doctors, but Lord, we know that you are the great physician. And Jesus, you are able to do in a moment what we can chase and seek for an entire lifetime. But Lord, I pray that you would meet people at the place of their faith today. And God, that they would walk out of here knowing that they've been touched by you. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And all the church said it good. Come on, give the Lord a good hand clap of praise today. I want to welcome all of our guests that are with us for the first time. We're honored you're here and to everyone worshiping with us online. It's always good to have you along for the ride. Come on, church, put your hands together one more time. Welcome our guests, our online family. So glad that you're here. Today is a special day at both of our campuses. We're celebrating with those that are taking their next step in their journey with Jesus by being water baptized today. If you're one of those individuals, would you just please stand really quickly if you would? We want to recognize you. Come on, let's show these people some love. We're so proud of you. Yeah. You may be seated. Some of you look like we need to hold you down just a little bit longer. Just, I'm just teasing. I'm so proud of you. I know God has great things in store. I also want to just remind you, you heard it in the news, but tonight, this afternoon at five, we're going to have a a parent night for all parents who have children, fifth grade and younger. Next week, it'll be older than fifth grade. Uh, But tonight at five, we would love to spend some time with you. I'll be here along with our kids ministry team sharing some vision and then really giving you some tools uh, as parents and, and an understanding of how we as a church want to partner with you in order to raise up an awesome, strong generation of world changers for God. How many of you know our kids are worth fighting for, huh? Come on, we got to fight for our families. Well, we're in week number two of a five-part series that we're calling You Ask For It, where we are addressing week by week the topics that you guys selected in a recent poll that, that we conducted. And last week, we learned from God's Word on how to manage the stress that we experience in life, hopefully you found that to be helpful. And today I'm going to share on a subject that affects every single one of us. Today we're going to learn how to resolve conflict. Do you know anything about conflict? Yeah. Some of you are afraid to say yes because the person you're in conflict with is sitting next to you right now. (laughs) Just, Just stay locked in. You know, our world's surrounded and ruled by conflict. You get online, you're going to hear about wars. You're going to hear about crime, political ideology. People are at each other's throats. So much tension in our world today. I kind of wish that it would stay out there in the world, but how many of you know it can sink in and creep into our own lives as well? We can experience conflict in our homes. If you're in a marriage relationship, you're dating, you're going to experience conflict. If you've got a job, you're going to have conflict. If you interact with humans at all, come on, you're going to have conflict some conflict. And here's the problem that we're all faced with. We don't always know how to deal with the conflict. I mean, I have amazing parents. My dad's in this service today and my mom, she's, and they're just godly people. And we couldn't really ask for more. As much as they taught us, I don't know if we really ever had a true understanding of how we should properly process conflict. Because in our home, this is how we did it. And I say this and, you know, just turn, look at it and laugh now, but whoever talked the loudest just won the argument, right? Just talk louder. That was my method. So I married Kara. Uh, She came from a house that didn't talk about anything. I mean, the whole house could be on fire, but everybody's just smiling, you know? It's like, yeah, the house is on fire. You know, don't worry about that. You know, just maybe it'll go away, you know? (laughs) So those two worlds collided. And we obviously had some issues on our hands. 
but it also affected different areas of my life. And, but today I'm going to talk to you about a skill that I don't believe you can live without. You must learn how to process conflict um, because, you know, it's something that brings, uh, uh, can bring peace if you do it correctly. And if you don't, it's just going to create more pain. So the secret to, to having happy and healthy relationships and a happy life in general is learning how to resolve conflict and learning this skill. Because in our culture, we're taught, don't try to mend the relationship, just move on from it. And I just can't help but think that God has a better way, and today His Word's going to show us how to do it the right way. Are you ready for God's Word today? Come on, anybody. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number five. We'll be learning from Jesus Himself, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus speaks of this. In verse 9, if you've got the, your notes or the church app, you'll, you can follow along with me. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In other words, Jesus is clearly saying to us, knowing how to work for peace and restoration in our relationships is proof. It is the proof that we are children of God. But what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Well, first, let me tell you what it's not. Peacemaking is not avoidance, like ignoring the problem, acting like it isn't there. That's not constructive, that's cowardice. And Jesus, he shows us time and time again how to address a legitimate conflict. He never walked away from conflict. No, he knew how to address it in a way that built, it built unity and it strengthened bonds between people. And that's who we want to be. Also, peacemaking is not appeasement. And that means that you just give in to everything and you just never stand up for yourself or what you believe in. And, and that's, not, that's not constructive, that's codependency. And if you find yourself like that, you're not going to be real happy. You got to learn how to do this. So you got to see what is peacemaking? Well, it's not peacekeeping because there's a big difference. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. So making peace, it should be our goal. But let me just put you at ease because some of you look nervous. If you've gone through a painful divorce or a separation of some kind, it doesn't mean that things go back to the way they were before. Some of you are like, Pastor, are you telling me to remarry my ex? I mean, what do I? <laughs> Don't worry. That's not what I'm saying at all. So I want you to, I want you to get this, though. But, but living as a peacemaker simply means that you choose to bury the hatchet and not allow that conflict to remain forever. Like, I'm going to have to process this in a God-honoring way and move on from that pain and, and release this situation into God's hand. Because what other option do you have, friends? I mean, how long are some of you, let me just ask you a question. How long are you going to live with this conflict, unresolved? How long is this going to drag out? Here's what I've noticed that unresolved conflict will produce in your life. Here's a few things if you're taking notes. And I encourage you to take notes because I'll save you thousands of dollars in counseling fees today, all right? <laughs> If you live with unresolved conflict, it will frustrate your fellowship with God. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, John writes, Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. He's not talking about family, brother, or sister. It could be that, but it could be anybody. He says, For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Here's what John is telling us, is that you can't be right with God and wrong with people at the same time. I mean, I can't say I'm right and tight with God when I'm choosing to fight with you. The, hors the, the horizontal and the vertical, they do not work independently from one another. They work together. Now, I'll be honest, there's some people that are gonna test you in this. And uh, I call those people EGRs, extra grace required. I'll see you coming a mile away and I'll tell Kara, here comes an EGR. Just, <laughs> just smile and nod and wave. Because I'm going to be honest, it's tough to love everybody. It's tough to treat people right when they're not treating you right. It's easy to hate people. I got to ask God to forgive me all the time because sometimes I hate people. Sometimes I pray things over people that I shouldn't be praying. I'm like, God, give them, I'll come up with something. Give them explosive diarrhea <laughs> in the most inopportune time. Standing just right before you check out at HEB, God hit them right there with everything heaven has. Just hit them. And I'm like, man, I can't pray like that. I'm a pastor. But we have to learn how to make peace. We can't live with that forever. Secondly, if you live with unresolved conflict, it'll prevent your prayers from being answered. Do you know that? When I'm not responding to people the right way, God's not answering my prayers in the way that I want him to. 
In 1 Peter chapter 3, this is addressed to husbands, but I believe it applies to us all. It says, husbands, dwell with your wives, with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to, your, to the wife as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Pastor, are you suggesting if I'm not nice to my wife, then God's not answering my prayers? That's exactly what I'm suggesting. That is exactly. Now, I want to remind everybody, listen for yourself today, not your spouse. Don't be amening and too loud and don't be elbowing people. Just take your own notes, you know. It's just for, it's for everybody. The third thing is that, that, that'll happen if you live with unresolved conflict. It'll hinder your happiness. You can't live, have a happy life when you're surrounded with conflict. You just can't. You could have all the money this world has to offer. You could live in the most luxurious, beautiful home. But if that home is filled with strife, it's not worth one cent. Because money can't buy this kind of happiness and peace. You got to know how to deal with some of the conflict. James chapter 3 tells us goodness is the harvest that is produced from the seeds that peacemakers plant in peace. In other words, I can experience the goodness of God if I'm a proactive uh, peacemaker. I'm planting seeds of peace in every relationship that I'm in so that God's goodness can be clearly seen in my life. Because if you, if you sow discord, plant seeds of discord, you're going to reap drama. But if you sow seeds of peace, you'll reap joy. And how many of you want some more peace and joy in your life? So God gives us a blueprint, and I'm going to give you five steps to take to resolve the conflict that may be in your life right now. And the first one is this. If you're going to resolve conflict, you must take the initiative. In other words, if you're in conflict with somebody, you got to make the first move. Well, I'm just giving it some time. Because time heals all wounds. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Time doesn't heal anything. If a wound is left untreated, it only festers and gets infected. So you can't just say, I'm giving it some time for the sake of not dealing with it. No, we must be proactive about this. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Pastor, you know, what if, what if I didn't do anything wrong? What if it was all their fault? Doesn't matter. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called children of God. Well, what if they don't want to be in my life or I don't want them in my life anymore? It doesn't matter. This doesn't mean things go back to the way that they were. It simply means I'm dealing with this conflict and I'm putting it to bed. What if they don't want to reconcile? It doesn't matter. Listen to this verse in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. It says, do everything possible on your part. Everybody say, on my part. To do what? To live in peace with everybody. It's the ownership and the responsibility is on you and me. Jesus talked about this very thing later in Matthew 5 and verse 22 or 23, excuse me, where he said, so if you are about to offer your gift to God at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you. So you got beef, someone's got beef with you. He said, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go at once and make peace with your brother and then come back and offer your gift to God. Jesus is saying reconciling a problem like this and, and conflict, it's more important than simply attending a worship service or hearing a message or singing a song. He said, it's better that you get up and leave and go get that right with that person and then come back. So I would say God would rather you leave this service right now than just allow that conflict to remain untreated and unresolved in your life. Now, if you decide to get up and leave in this service for that reason, let me remind you what it says. It said, leave your offering before you go. <laughs> and our ushers are at the door to serve you. So happy to be a blessing to you. You know, I know Christians that don't know how to do this very well. And their lives are just littered with broken relationships here and there and everywhere else. Um, they can't get along with people. They're judgmental, they're fault finders. And what I find is that those people are usually the ones that are, that are, easy, they, they are offended the most easily. I mean, they just get offended about everything. And then what do they do? Well, they don't try to work it out like healthy people do. They leave the church that they're in. Why do you think that there are some churches in America called the second church of something? 
because they, let, they got mad at the first church. <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking. And then they, they start the second. But that's not how God's called us to live our lives. Because if you are an easily offended person, it is the mark that you are an immature person. You're immature. I know Christians, I was raised in a Pentecostal type church that love to talk about the gifts of the spirit. They wanted to have proof in the service that God was at work. And they wanted to know, they wanted to focus on the gifts of the spirit, but they didn't care anything about the fruit of the spirit, which is in Galatians 5, in which all of the fruit of the spirit are only seen through quality, healthy relationships, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I think we don't have to choose one over the other. Come on. I think we can have the fruit of the spirit and the power of the spirit at work in our church and in our lives. Amen, everybody. You say, well, Josh, you don't know what they did to me. I don't, I, they, I'm mad about it. Well, let's talk about anger for a minute because I know a lot of people are angry. First thing you need to know about anger is that you can't deny your anger, but you need to see anger for what it is. Anger is always a secondary emotion. It's never the primary emotion because it means that something happens. So you're feeling something else and anger is the way that you respond to it because it protects you. It's the fight or flight type syndrome, you know, thing going on in your brain, but you can't deny your anger. Usually it's because of something happened. A boundary was crossed. A word, hurtful word was said. And, and I love talking to couples, married people. Where are all the married people at in here today, by the way? Are you out there? Are you married people? Happily married. Woo! Yes. You better get those hands up, bro. And here's what I know. We show that we're angry in different ways. Every, every couple, every marriage has a skunk and a turtle. A skunk lets you know real quick that he's not happy or she's not happy. Just pshhh. Everybody knows, hey, okay, something's wrong. A turtle, they don't let you know anything. They just hide. You know, they, they hide from you. And here's the thing. If you're a skunk, you're married to a turtle. And if you're a turtle, God puts you with a skunk. God has a sick sense of humor. I mean, it's something else. But I, I also realize that some people repress their anger because they were an angry home. They were raised in an angry home. And their parents didn't make it as a couple and they, they divorced and they came out of brokenness. So they saw anger as the reason why the, the marriage didn't work. So I've seen people that, that, are, that are products of a broken home. They don't know how to deal with their anger because they're afraid if they bring something up and they're angry, it's going to make their relationship end. But I don't think that's the case because we got to learn how to, angry, uh, to be angry. And, and listen to this. When you're angry, don't justify your sin when you're angry. That's the key. In Ephesians 4, verse 26, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Well, they made me do it. Wrong. Nobody made you do anything. Well, if they hadn't have done that, then I wouldn't have done that. That's the old if and then. No, no, no. You did it. And if you think for just a moment that God's going to condone your ugly behavior because of the actions of someone else, you are absolutely deceived and delusional. God will hold you and I responsible for every word that we say, every action that we commit. And I know some of you have been done, uh, done wrong, and there is legitimate injustice in this world. But I see groups of people, even our own nation, who weren't treated right, that are now doing things that are ungodly in the name of defending themselves or trying to get their, you know, and just saying God isn't giving any of that a green light. He's not condoning any of that. We are to be people of peace. And let, let vengeance belong to God. As he said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not yours. God will make every wrong right. That's what's going to be so wonderful about heaven. Is that God's going to make every wrong right. He's going to dry every tear from every eye. So we got to trust God with that. Another thing about anger is you can't go to bed while you're angry. Ephesians 4.26 says, do not let the sun go down while you're still anger. angry. Today's anger is not the problem. It's when yesterday's anger comes into today, that's when things start moving in the wrong direction. So if you're married, you're going to have a lot of disagreements. Um, and there will be times you're going to be tempted to go to bed angry at your spouse. And when you do that, you are slowly destroying your relationship. This is why a couple can stand before a pastor madly in love on the day of their wedding and just a few years stand in front of a judge and hate each other. It's because they don't know how to deal with their anger. No one's ever taught them how to resolve conflict. When Karen and I are having a disagreement, which we like to call intense fellowship. <laughs> and if we don't come to a place of unity on the matter as the day goes on, I'll start reminding her, hey, it's getting later. 
And as the evening comes, I was like, hey, the sun's going down, girl. It's not too late to apologize. You know where to find me. But it's dangerous when you do it. And then when you're angry, and especially if you're married, don't give the devil a foothold. You got to know that. Because don't give him a place. Ephesians 4 verse 27 says, do not give the devil a foothold. That word devil in the original Greek language, which is what the, Old Te- the New Testament was originally written in. And we've got, they've, they've got records of these old texts. So if you're one that thinks that man changed the Bible and they took things out, no, no, no. There's the original text. That's the beauty about the Bible. There are original texts that all agree with each other. We have the historical documents. And that's just a little soapbox I've been on recently. Because so many of you are tempted to be- not to believe the Bible because you heard somebody say, well, man changed the Bible. Man did not change the Bible. Not that every word in the Greek translates perfectly into English, so they had to do some things right uh, to get it right. But it, it's not like the message has been changed one bit. But we've got to see here that this word devil in the Greek is the word diabolos, which means slanderer. And you know what it means to slander somebody, right? You say something that's not true, that damages their reputation. So when you go to bed angry, the devil works in your subconscious mind to plant thoughts in your head about your spouse or that family member or that coworker that aren't even true. And it turns your heart away from that person. Why? Because his goal for you is destruction and he will use isolation in order to destroy you. So we have to be wise. Some of you need to take initiative, and you may need to get this thing on the calendar, a meeting, a peace powwow, if you will. Now, if you're married, let me give you some, give you some advice. How you bring this up matters. Wives, can I just tell you, can I help the ladies in here for a second? Will you let your pastor help you? Yeah, here's, here's some advice. Don't look at your husband ever and say, we need to talk. <laughs> you will never see him again. He will live in some closet. He will find a good place in the garage to lay his weary head. What's wrong with just saying, hey, I'd like to visit with you about some things? To just make it a little bit more like, okay, this isn't going to, doesn't have to be a heavy thing, even though we're talking about something heavy. But you got to ask God for wisdom. How do I bring this up? Some of you need to ask God for courage because you're afraid to bring this up because it may be a family member or a coworker. But you've got to take initiative. Secondly, you got to take ownership. This simply means that you own your part of the conflict. This can be difficult. Why? Because of this thing called pride. And we're all born with it. I talk to couples. I talk to people that are in conflict. And I say, tell me what happened. Well, they did this. Okay, so they are responsible. Yes. How much would you say? They're 100% responsible. Like, really? You are so delusional if you believe that. I like to think of a pie chart. And I like to think, how much of this is yours? How much is theirs? I'm like, is it 50-50? Oh, no, pastor. They did way more than 50% of it. I'll get to the point where I'm like, is it 99 to 1? Yeah, that sounds a little bit more right. (laughs) But here's what you need to know. You got to own your slice and be nice. You got to own your part of it. Because there ain't none of us in here with the name Jesus Christ. And ain't none of y'all the Holy Spirit. And I know some of you think your job is to point out all the faults and flaws that you see in the people around you. But that's not your job. If you're in a conflict, you have a part to play in that. And let me prove it to you. In James chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your evil desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you do what? quarrel and fight you do not have because you do not ask God now God put legitimate desires on the inside of us all ladies if you're in a relationship you want to feel secure and loved and God put that desire on the inside of you all the men in here God put a desire in us to be honored and respected and when we don't get what we want from the person that we're in a relationship with what do we do we lash out at them so the need that's not be, they're not meeting in us, it spills over. But James is saying the reason why it's spilling over is you're not going to the need meter. You're looking to an imperfect human being to give you that which only God can give you. So every day I get up and I spend time with God, he's filling my cup. 
I got to go to him first and most. I can't go to Kara with an empty cup and say, fill this up for me. And some of us, you're asking your spouse to do things for you that they are not capable of doing. They can't give you everything that you need. So when you're at peace with God, you can be at peace with anybody. Almost nothing gets under your skin. But if you're not at peace with God and peace with yourself, almost anything can set you off. So we have to take ownership of our part and, and stop using words like incompatibility. That's a bunch of baloney. There's no such thing. You choose who you will be compatible with. You choose who you're going to allow to, who you're going to love. Incompatibility is just another word for immaturity, if you want to look at it like that. Because when you choose not to work it out in a relationship, you're simply saying, I'm too immature to change. I want you to do all the changing. And that's just, and the root of that is pride, and it's destructive. If incompatibility were a reason for divorce, Kara and I would not have celebrated 23 years of marriage yesterday. We're, we're, the, we're two of the most completely opposite people on the planet. Like, y'all are so much alike. No, we're not. She likes vanilla, I like chocolate. I like watching sports on TV. She likes watching these Dateline murder shows that are just dark. Why are you laughing? It's sick. Like, what are you doing, research? Are you like preparing for something I need to be concerned about? What are we doing here? But when you live with the sense of, you know, I'm not gonna change, it's called pride. And this is what pride does. Proverbs 13, 10 says, pride leads only to arguments. You wonder why you're fighting so much? Because there's a lot of pride in your house. And somebody's not willing to change. Someone's not willing to look in the mirror. Now, I want to say this to everybody that's gone through a painful divorce. I would never put shame on you for that. I love you. I'm your pastor. I'm for you. I'm not here to remind you of your past. I'm here to remind you of your future that can be blessed when you, when you walk with Jesus. So I'm not, I don't want anybody to feel any shame over that. There are legitimate reasons in Scripture for divorce. Nowhere in God's word does it give someone the right to physically abuse somebody, nor does it give someone the right to abandon their responsibilities. So, but here's what I know, no matter what's happened in your relationship, whether it could be infidelity, I, I don't care how bad it may seem, seem to be, if there are two people in that relationship that are willing to forgive one another and trust God, they can walk through hell with a water pistol and win. Listen, God can help their marriage become stronger and heal it, he can do that. And we as a church, we want to help. So I can't help but think, though, that some of you are here in conflict with somebody right now. You think about that person right now. Think about that person. Look at their face. But stay smiling. I don't want to. I want you to stay smiling. Breathe. The relationship is stuck. There's a log jam. You're in, it's like bumper to bumper traffic. Nothing's changing. Maybe you haven't talked to this person in years. But deep down inside, you may love them. Or they're a part of your life still. Maybe they're an ex or somebody. Listen, here's what I want you to see. Here's one phrase that can change everything. Are you ready? Are you taking notes? Here it is. I'm sorry I was only thinking of myself. I think we should practice saying that. Because some of you are like, I don't understand this language he's speaking right now. Did you catch that? Okay, let's try it. Are you ready? I'm sorry I was only thinking of myself. Everybody still alive, right? Everybody still alive? Now, once you say that, you're going to have to help them up off of the floor because they're going to be just totally shocked. But the reason why you need to say that is because every one of us in this room right now, we have these things called blind spots. There are things in our personality that we don't see as being abrasive and it annoys people and we can be un ungrateful, we can be demanding, we can be needy, overly sensitive. And, and Jesus talks about blind spots a couple chapters later in Matthew 7. In verse, 20, in verse 3, he says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Think telephone pole. He said, How can you say to your brother, Let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus was a funny guy. This is this, uh, this way Hebrew, the, the culture there, would use exaggeration for like comedic, comedic effect. So remember he said things like, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. 
So he's saying these things. People are like, oh, this Jesus, you're killing me. You're hilarious. So all the haters out there that say I use too much humor, I am trying to be like the greatest teacher that has ever walked on planet Earth. And I learned from Jesus that a little bit of humor, a little bit of joy can help the medicine go down just a little bit easier. And God's word is medicine. And this is a painful subject we're talking about today. But you may have some blind spots. You may be knocking people over with the telephone pole in your eye. And you weren't about a piece of, a piece of dust in someone else's eye. This is why we need to be in small groups. We need people in our life that we give permission to tell us the truth. Because they love us. They're not trying to hurt us. They're trying to help us. And our church is filled with people like that. I can learn from you. You can learn from me. We can all learn from each other. And then you need to ask God, God reveal to me my blind spots. What am I not seeing here? Now get ready. He'll talk to you about it. And here's what I found because I'm married that his voice sounds a lot like Kara. <laughs> if you're not married, that's why you need a small group. You need someone that you allow into your life that can help you become stronger. Third thing is listen before you speak. If you're trying to resolve this thing, listen before you speak. When you get ready to make peace, think about James 1.19. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen more than you talk. Listen for the hurt behind what they're saying. There's always a reason why there's an offense. And while you're listening, don't do what I've done a thousand times. Be formulating your response in there. After the first few words, okay, I got enough here. Now I'm going to go into, like, I'm coming up with a zinger. Like, I'm coming back, man. Listen. Fully listen. And you've, here's the thing. If you're going to have great relationships, you've got to give people the right to criticize you or to complain to you without feeling threatened. One of the department stores Karen and I like to shop at, we chose it because, and we keep going back because they have great customer service. So I had this pair of shoes I bought one time and they were coming apart. I'd already worn them a few times, but it was like they were coming apart. So I took them back and like, hey, I was wondering, could we do something about this? She, the lady looked at it. She says, oh, Mr. Joins, I'm so sorry. This shouldn't have happened. We're just going to give you a new pair. Would you like a new pair? And I'm like, well, can we fix it? She goes, we're going to give you a new pair. It's not a problem. This shouldn't have happened. She was so nice. She wasn't threatened. You know, some stores that aren't very nice, you go in there, let's say you wore a shirt, and you know, like, I wore it once, and they'll be smelling the armpits to prove it. Like, yeah, you wore this three times, and they don't want to help you. I wonder if when people come to you with legitimate complaints, are you threatened by them? Do you turn them away? Do you kick them out of your store of your life? Or do you try to lean in and meet their needs? There are things that I need to do better for my wife. And I'll ask her, what can I do better? What can I help you with? What needs do I, am I not meeting? Listen, I'll crawl over, you know, a bed of hot coals, walk over a bed of hot coals in order to meet her needs because she is the most important person in the world to me. So hey, if I can get better, let me know. I, I want to get better. So if you, you, you need to ask yourself about that. Am I listening to people? Am I, or am I punishing them for telling me the truth? Some of you punish your spouse because they tell you the truth. You shut them out, you fire the insults at them, or you withhold from them, or you, you, know, you, you distance yourself from them. Listen, none of that is okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are we going to be people that are blessed because we're peacemakers, because children of God act like their father God? And we can't act like him on our own. How many of you know he gives us the power to do what's right? Amen, everybody? The fourth thing, speak the truth in love. When you do start talking, say, speak the truth, but say it in love. There better be enough love to hold the truth you're about to give. You ever seen someone wearing clothes that are too tight? There's more of them than there are clothes. It's painful to watch, you know? I like, mean, that button comes off, I'm losing an eye, you know? Listen, when you bring in the truth, you better make sure there's enough love to hold the truth you're about to deliver. Are you following me? Ephesians 4 verse 15, it said, speak the truth in the spirit of love and we grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. It takes a lot of maturity to do this because when you just start saying whatever you want and hey, listen, despite what you believe, you can control what you say. You can. Proverbs 12 verse 18 says, thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. 
I want to be a person that knows how to say the right thing at the right time. You can be that kind of person. The researchers at the University of Washington many years ago did a study about couples that were married and stayed married and those that divorced. And they found that those that could establish the right tone within the first three minutes of a disagreement, they made it. While those that did not, their marriage, their marriage failed. So if you're in a conversation or conflict and you find yourself quickly going to insults, raising your voice, slamming doors, that's also known as throwing a fit. Toddlers do that. And then we just grow up and then the mistakes we make and the damage we cause are more expensive and more hurtful. When you find yourself doing that, your marriage really has no, cho- no chance of survival if you continue down that road. But thank God for his word. He helps gently nudge us back onto the right track. Proverbs 15, 1 says, a gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. And can I be honest with you? I haven't always gotten this right. I'm never going to get up here and tell you that I'm something I'm not. I haven't been a good husband for 23 years. I haven't. I haven't. I've, I've been harsh. I haven't been gentle. There are times I just dismiss what she's saying because, fellas, you know, when a woman brings you a complaint, sometimes you're like, well, it's just that time. I don't even want to say it. <laughs> I'm not even going to say it in here. Don't say it if that's you. Don't, don't. But, I, but if I, I did stuff like that. Or I just said, eh, she'll, she'll, it'll go, hey. When the scripture we read earlier says, husbands dwell with them with understanding. That doesn't mean to just live inside the same building or house. It means to dwell with them in life and understanding your wife is your responsibility as a husband. And I had to begin to see Kara as a person that was raised a certain way. She's been through things even before I came into her life. There are certain fears that she has just on the inside that just come. We call them ants between she and I and we call them automatic negative thoughts. And, and sometimes those things will come out and I have to learn, okay, listen, I can't just reply in any way and just be harsh or say, what's your problem? Or the, you know, the coin, the famously coined phrase, just get over it. I have to lean in and Ephesians 4, 29 becomes so much more powerful when I do. It says, do not use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed so that what you say will do good to those who hear you. Another translation says edify, which means to build up. So I want to use these words in a way that builds up the people in my life. Build up people that God's put in my church family. Build up people that I meet. And and there's some things that some of us need to stop saying immediately. You heard of weapons of mass destruction, WMDs? Some of us have words of mass destruction. And Colossians 3 says you got to get rid of all these things. What are they? Paul says, anger, passion, hateful feelings, no insults or obscene talk must ever come from your lips. Must ever come. Some of you need to ask God to forgive you and you need to ask the person in your life, I need you to forgive me. I haven't been the kind of person that that you, you didn't deserve that. Nothing deserves that. Now, there is a difference between complaint and criticism. So for those of you that are overly sensitive or overly harsh, this is for you. A complaint is about me and a criticism is about you. So you can complain, just don't criticize. So you could say to your spouse, when you said this, it made me feel like this. I'm not sure that was your intent, but I want you to know how I felt. A criticism, that's a legitimate complaint. Criticism would be you're a complete insert your favorite profane word in this place. And you've always been this way. I regret the day that I married you. I want out of this marriage. Now, that would be a criticism. (laughs) That would be out of bounds. You're just saying, hey, devil, come in here and just destroy what God is building. You do that with your words. Your husband goes out or your wife goes out. Let's say, let's pick on the wives for a second. (laughs) Husbands always get the, the rough end of the deal, but... Let's say you look on the credit card statement. Oh, she's been to Target again. <laughs> apparently, we needed a, apparently, we needed another pillow. <laughs> One more cross to put on the wall. I had to reinforce the wall, the last cross she put up. 
We need another happy, happy, living, hopeful sign, you know. <laughs> so you could say, hey, love, I know we talked about we've been on a budget and pastor, you know, been talking about living within our means. Hey, we're, we're tithing now. And we need to be good stewards. And I saw you went back to Target. I thought, we let's talk about these things before you do them next time. Because this is putting us in a jam. That's, that's a complaint. A criticism would be, you're just such a bum. What do you think, money just grows on trees? What do you think, I'm just trying to work my, are you trying to work my, kill me by making me work so much? You're just like your mother. First of all, I'm not sure why any man would ever let those words come out of his mouth. What could possibly be helped by saying that? Now, obviously, that's a criticism. Are you following me here? And it's up to you and I. Here's what I know. Happy couples know that when only one wins, they both lose. They both lose. So we got to get to this point where we, where we learn how to, how, to, how to release that. Because the goal is to fix the problem, not the blame. Not the blame. Here's the fifth and final thing. We gotta get, I got to get you guys out of here. Is this helping anybody today? Yeah. Is that we've got to focus on the right goal. What should our goal be when we're processing conflict? Here it is. Reconciliation, not resolution. Reconciliation simply says this. I want to reestablish the relationship. Resolution says, I want us to agree on every issue. That world does not exist. There is no one that's going to agree with you on everything. Karen and I have been walking together for 23 years as husband and wife. And while we disagree on many things, and we don't see everything eye to eye, that doesn't keep us from walking hand in hand. You can walk hand in hand. And and you can have unity. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. We believe exactly. No, we don't agree about everything. We don't agree as parents. We didn't always agree how to, how to raise our kids. But we'd come to a place of agreement. And, and we'd say, you know what? Let's just, let's focus on these things right here. Reconciliation. How do you reconcile? Here's what, this is a tough one. And when I say this word, it creates a lot of, sometimes people get mad at me over what I'm about to say. And they'll come argue with me in the lobby. But I'm committed to having good relationships, so I listen to them. In order to have reconciliation, you must be willing to forgive that person. Now, forgiveness is not saying what they did was okay or it wasn't a big deal. Forgiveness doesn't even mean that things go back to the way they were before. You may not even be married to this person anymore. The person that you're mad at may not even be alive anymore. But you're over here and you're just angry at them. That's called unforgiveness. And unforgiveness is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It will destroy you. Some of you need to forgive your mom. Forgive your dad. It doesn't mean what they did was okay. It simply says, I'm getting out of this prison cell. I've been called to live in freedom. I am a child of God. And God is a forgiving God. We don't have time for, we don't have time to read this scripture, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 says, God is a God of reconciliation. And he's called us to be people of reconciliation. Do you know what God reconciled? Do you know how hard God had to work in order to forgive you? When you weren't even thinking about God, when you were living your life your own way, when man had sinned against God, God said, I'm not waiting for them to come to me. I'm going down to them. And this big canyon between us and God that sin had created, nothing man could do. They tried. We'll follow these laws. We'll be good people. We'll we'll put it all on us. God said, hey, listen, they're never going to get over it. I know that. But he said, I'm going to build a bridge. I'm going to make a way. And he did it through the cross of Jesus Christ. And when we were at our worst, God sent us his best. He gave his best. He gave us Jesus. 
And it's only with God's help and God's love that you can forgive somebody. Well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. You're exactly right, and neither did you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I have a relationship with God. Maybe that relationship is... It's been broken by sin. And you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus. Time is short in this service right now, but I want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I'd like to pray with you. And if you're here and you want me to include you in that prayer, would you just lift your hand up right there where you are? I won't embarrass you. I won't make you stand. I just want to see your hand. Nobody's looking but me. Thank you, Lord. So many hands going up today. In the riser. God bless you. God bless you. Put your hand on your heart. Let's say this prayer together. Say it in faith. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he's your son. He died on the cross for my sins. You raised him from the dead. He is alive. Jesus Christ, come live in me. I repent of my sins. I make you my Lord. Today I choose to follow you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, can we celebrate with those who prayed that prayer today? Thank you for joining us for Faith Family Online. We hope this service was a blessing and an encouragement to you. It's always an honor to have you worship with us from wherever you may be. If this is your first time joining us, we want to give you a special welcome. You can text the word FAITH to the number 55498 to connect with us and learn more. But don't stop there. You can join us in person every Sunday at any of our campuses. For more information on service times and locations, go to our website at myfaithfamily.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you soon.